Hello and good morning to everyone everywhere. Welcome to the 11 a.m. Assembly of the Orange Vale Church of Christ. My name is Chuck Polis, and in addition to our online assembly that's happening right now, we also have an in-person indoor assembly that happens at 9 a.m. on Sundays. And so if you're in the neighborhood, we pray that you'll drop by next Sunday and join us. Later on today at 6, we have a Zoom Adult Bible class that's looking at the Epistles of John. And tonight we'll be finishing up 3rd John and starting the Gospel of John. And then on Wednesday nights, our Zoom Adult Bible class at 7 is studying the book of Genesis. And we'll be getting into Genesis chapter 6 this Wednesday. We also have a Zoom children's class that happens at 5.30 p.m. on Tuesdays, and that class is for children between the ages of 8 and 12. Plus, we also offer a more comprehensive, work-at-your-own-pace kind of Bible study with a real-life Bible study helper, and you can sign up for that by visiting our website at ovchurch.org and clicking on the banner for World Bible School. And if you want any more information on any of those classes, even some tech support on how to get connected with Zoom, please message us through Facebook, YouTube, or you can email me directly at minister at ovchurch.org so we can get you the Zoom ID and the class materials that you need and get you connected. We want to pray for Rhonda, Nikki's daughter today. Um, she's scheduled for cancer surgery this upcoming Thursday, and the family has asked for prayers, and if possible, if anyone can help out financially, to please get in touch with Nikki. And as always, if you have any announcements for next week's bulletin or prayer requests, please let us know. Let's pray. Father God, we do so thank you for this day, and Father, pray that you will accept our worship as pleasing in your sight, and Father, as we lift our voices in song to you, might it be a sweet sound to your ears. And Father, we lift up Nikki and her daughter Rhonda as Rhonda is about to go through some serious surgery and is struggling financially. We pray that you will bless Rhonda and her family, give them strength, give Rhonda the health she needs, help Nikki as she tends to her daughter. Please, Father, bless the family. We do ask in Christ. Good morning. Today's scripture reading is taken from the book of Gospel of John. I'll be reading from John 12, 25 to 37 from the International Version. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Each day I'll do, Each day I'll do a golden deed. A golden deed. By helping those, By helping those who, are in me. who are in me. My life on earth, My life on earth is but a span. Is but a span. And, so I'll do and so I'll do the best I can. The best I can. Life's evening sun. Life's evening sun. Is sinking low. And I must go to meet the deeds that I have done, where there will be no setting sun, no setting sun, to be a child of God each day. Evening sun. Life's evening sun is sinking low. Is sinking low. A few more days. A few more days. And I must go. And I must go to meet the deeds that I have done. Where there will be no setting sun. No setting sun. The only life that will endure is one that's kind. Each day I'll lend a helping hand. 
Life's evening sun. Life's evening sun is sinking low. Is sinking low. A few more days. A few more days. And I must go. And I must go to meet the deeds. To meet the deeds. Sinking low, is sinking low. A few more days, a few more days, and I must go. And I must go to meet the deeds, to meet the deeds that I have done. I have done. Where there will be, Where there will be no setting sun, no setting sun. Lies evening sun. Lies evening sun is sinking low. It's at this time that we would like to invite you to share the Lord's Supper with us wherever you may be. Over in Mark chapter 14 and verses 22 through 25, we read about what Jesus told his disciples to do in remembrance of him. There we read, as they were eating, he, Jesus, took bread and after blessing it, broke it and he gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. And he took the cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. 
Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Now, why do some people call the Lord's Supper the Eucharist? Just what does Eucharist mean? Well, Eucharist is the Greek word that's used in our text here and in parallel passages that's often translated as give thanks. And so the Eucharist is a thanksgiving. All right, well, just how is the Lord's Supper a thanksgiving? Well, remember, Jesus took the bread and Eucharist, that's the Greek word. He gave thanks, you see, and he broke the bread. The same way with the cup, right? And so in our text, Jesus gives thanks for the broken bread that represents his broken body. And he gives thanks for the fruit of the vine, which represents his blood shed on the cross. And he told his disciples to remember him in the bread and the cup, to give thanks. Now, I'm not trying to get us to change how we refer to the Lord's Supper, but I think it's important that we understand that Jesus was giving thanks for the bread and the cup, that he was thankful for what God had given him. And we're not just talking about, you know, the actual food items, right? But for his mission to save us all from our sins. And so the disciples would remember him and why he came, and what he had done. And so we should be thankful too as we remember Jesus in the bread and the cup. And so now as we share this simple thanksgiving to remember Jesus, may our hearts swell with gratitude for the amazing gift of God that is Jesus Christ. Let us give thanks now for the bread and the cup. Most Holy Father, we do so thank you for this bread that represents your son's body. And Father, as we partake of it, Help us to remember all that he has done for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Shall we continue with our thanksgiving? Most Holy Father, again, we do so thank you for this cup, this cup that represents the blood that was shed on the cross so that we might have the forgiveness of sins. And Father, as we partake of it, might we give thanks for all that you have given us and for your son, Jesus, especially. In his name we pray. And that concludes the Lord's Supper, and it's at this time, out of a matter of convenience, that we take up the offering. It may come to a surprise to some that there is no command in the New Covenant for Christians to submit to a legalistic system of tithes. The New Testament nowhere designates a percentage of income that a Christian should set aside for the work of the church. Instead, we are told that our gifts should be in keeping with our income. We're, so, we're shown that over in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 2. If we see any commands in the New Testament about giving, we see that we are commanded to give as we are able with our hearts. And that means that sometimes we give more than 10%. And sometimes it means we give less. It all depends upon the ability of the Christian and the needs of the church. The point is, every Christian should diligently pray and seek God's wisdom in the matter of their own personal giving. And most importantly, if anything, we give, we should give with pure motives and an attitude of worship to God because of what Jesus has done for us. We give in thanksgiving, you see. We're reminded over in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 7 that each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let's pray.
Father God, we do so thank you for blessing us so much. And Father, as we pray and meditate over all that you have blessed us with, help us to give back to you for the furthering of your kingdom. In Jesus' name. As always, you're welcome to bring your offering by during your next visit here to our building, or you could use whatever services that your bank has to offer, possibly bill pay or some other system. You may also simply just mail us a check to 5915 Main Avenue, Orangevale, California, 95662. That's at this time that we want to encourage you to sing along with the song before the message today. God forgave my sin in Jesus' name. I've been born again in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name I come to you to share his love as he told me to. He said, freely, freely you have received. Freely, freely. you believe, others will know that I live. All power is given in Jesus' name, in earth and heaven, in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name I come to you to share His power as He told me to. You know, in the age of electronic currency, you don't see all that many bills being used to buy stuff that much anymore. But when you do use bills, you know, you go to a store and you hand them a 20 or, or maybe a larger bill, and all of a sudden they gotta hold it up to the line or they take out one of those little magic pens and they line it across it. You think, well, why are they doing that? Well, simply because people do try to pass off funny money. And if you don't have the skills to know the difference by looking up to the light or having one of those little special pens, a good counterfeit can be hard to detect. Well, what about counterfeit Christians or deceptive disciples? Think about it. Anyone can claim to be a Christian without actually being one. But you can spot a true disciple because of their similarity to their master. As a matter of fact, over in Luke chapter 6 and verse 40, Jesus said, A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. Now, last week, we started our new sermon series on discipleship, and we talked about how when someone is a disciple of Jesus, it means that Jesus is the core and the center of their lives and that Jesus is their Lord and Savior. And today, we want to explore the call of discipleship. And to help us to do that, we're going to start things off by looking at Matthew chapter 4 and verses 18 through 22, where we're told that as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father, Zebedee preparing their nets. Jesus called to them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Now, 
Whenever people read this for the very first time, you just kind of have to wonder, did these guys ever meet Jesus before he called them and they just dropped everything and followed him? Well, over in Luke chapter 5, in a parallel passage, we read about how Jesus got into Simon's boat and made him put out to deep water so he could do some additional fishing. Even though Simon had fished all night and he didn't catch anything. And even though Simon didn't want to, he obeyed Jesus' instructions and ended up with such a huge catch of fish that he needed the help of their fishing partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Over in John chapter 1, we also read about some things that happened prior to the calling. We read about Simon's brother Andrew, who was a disciple of John the Baptist, we discover. And how John the Baptist, just after Jesus' baptism, Andrew was there and heard John identify Jesus as the Lamb of God. Well, right after that, Andrew made the choice to follow Jesus. And then Andrew went and found his brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah. And then he brought Peter to meet Jesus. The point is, when we read what happened in Matthew chapter 4 about when Jesus called the fishermen to follow him, it wasn't their first time meeting him. That said, it doesn't change the power of the call of Jesus to discipleship and their response to the call. And so, with all that in mind, let's spend some time today breaking all that down into three parts of discipleship that we see in the call Jesus gave them that day. And the first part of the calling of discipleship is to follow Jesus. Think about it from Jesus' perspective, right? A disciple is a person who follows him. And so to answer the call of discipleship is to follow Jesus. Now, what we have to remember is that in Jesus' day, it was a pretty big deal to be a disciple of a rabbi. And I'm sure that Peter, Andrew, James, and John were simply honored to have a rabbi like Jesus call lowly fishermen to be his disciples. And even though they only knew a little bit about Jesus that day when he called them, they were about to spend the next three plus years learning all about Jesus, including his position, his power, and his teachings. And so, like them, if we are to be disciples of Jesus, then we need to also recognize and accept who Jesus is and place ourselves under his authority. Think about it. When, when Jesus called them to follow him, they understood that being a disciple meant to be positioned behind their leader. How else can you follow a leader if you're not behind them, right? And those positions and lines of authority are fixed. Jesus leads and we follow. Over in John chapter 12 and verse 26, Jesus said it this way. He said, whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. And so as, as we come to understand who Jesus is and what he expects from us, we have to decide whether or not to follow him. The thing is, you know, there are people who like the idea of Jesus as their savior, but they don't quite like the idea of Jesus being their Lord or above them. But you know, Jesus cannot be one without the other. Jesus is who he is, and we must accept him as he is and follow him if we want to be his disciples. That means that the first thing that we need to do in answering the call is to submit ourselves and follow Jesus. And when we do that, then Jesus becomes our head. And of course, I don't mean our actual physical head, right? but in our minds, you know, because when we know who Jesus is, 
We accept him as our head, as our authority, as our leader and our master. Jesus is our savior and our Lord, and we are his followers. Again, the first thing that we need to understand about the call of discipleship is that disciples of Jesus follow Jesus. And the second part of the calling of discipleship is that Jesus will remake you. And so to answer the call of discipleship is to be changed by Jesus. Think about when Jesus invited Peter, Andrew, James, and John to be his followers. They were to leave behind what they were, all of it, and to follow him on a new path, a new direction, following the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so from the get-go, Jesus intended to change them from what they were into who they needed to become. He was to remake them into something other than what they were. And so instead of fishermen, they were to become fishers of men. And so Jesus got to work on them, teaching them and training them and shaping them into the people that they needed to be to carry out his mission as his disciples. Over in John chapter 15 and verses 1 and 2, Jesus explained it this way. He told them, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. In other words, being a disciple of Jesus means that a pruning process, if you will, needs to take place. Think about it. No one begins as a disciple with the ability to produce all the fruit that God wants us to produce. But over the course of time, through God's work and our cooperation, good fruit will result. Just think about all the changes that God needed to bring about in the lives of the twelve. But in the course of three plus years, as a result of the discipling of Jesus, Jesus shaped those men into a group who were to be able to be his representatives in and to the world. But of course, it was a process. It didn't happen overnight. And so Jesus invested his time in the twelve, and he taught them, and he empowered them to be like him. It was a process of change that, that, that meant that involved Jesus shaping their beliefs, you know, and, and their thinking, and their attitudes, and their actions, so that they could be the messengers of the good news to the world. The thing is, this transformational process is what God wants for all of the disciples of Jesus. The Apostle Paul says it this way over in Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. He writes, For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. The point is, God desires to have many, 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 many sons and daughters who are conformed into the image of his son. God wants to transform us into the likeness of Jesus. And just how does all that happen? Well, it happens as we follow Jesus. And since Jesus isn't physically here for us to follow, we have to follow him through his word. So we read and we study and we pray and we allow his Holy Spirit to lead us and to shape us. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18, we read that we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. And so what Paul is telling us is that the Holy Spirit works in us to transform us into the image of our Lord. And as we transform more and more into the likeness of our Lord Jesus, he uses us. He uses you and me 
to help lead others to Jesus. And so in order to be a disciple of Jesus, we must follow Jesus and submit ourselves to his changing power that is at work within us, shaping our heart and our character to be more and more like Jesus so that we can fulfill the third part of the calling of discipleship, and that is to become fishers of people. In other words, to answer the call of discipleship is to be engaged in the mission of Jesus. Just think back to the first four disciples, to Peter, Andrew, James, and John. They were fishers of fish, right? But their new mission was to become fishers of people. And that's, and that's because the cause and the mission of the disciples of Jesus is people. Think about what we know about Jesus, right? We know that Jesus came to seek and save the lost, Luke 19, 10. And we know that Jesus came to not be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, Mark chapter 10 and verse 45. And we also know that Jesus told the crowd in John chapter 8 and verse 24 that if they did not believe that he was who he said he was, God's one and only son, the Messiah, that they would die in their sin. And so as we follow Jesus and are changed by Jesus, being engaged in the mission of Jesus is a natural spiritual progression. Because as disciples of Jesus, we know and understand and are compelled by the truth that if people do not come to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, then they are lost for eternity. Take a look at what Paul had to say about that over in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 10 through 11. There he writes, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade men. Then, picking up at verse 17 and going down through verse 21, listen to the conviction and the urgency in Paul as he writes these words. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Clearly, Paul had the conviction and the urgency to answer the call of discipleship. And because he had that conviction and the urgency, he was able to engage in the mission of Jesus. And all of us who are disciples of Jesus should have that same conviction and that same urgency about the lost and the salvation of their souls so that we will be engaged in the mission of Jesus. That is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. We follow Jesus and we're changed by Jesus and we're committed to carrying out Jesus' mission to save the lost. That truth should affect everything about us. The way we think, the way we pray, the way we spend our time and our money, everything. So as disciples of Jesus, we understand and believe that there are only two categories of people. There's the saved and the unsaved. And we don't judge or condemn them. We don't judge or condemn the lost. 
Instead, we reach out to them. And that's because, like Jesus, we long to see unbelievers be reconciled to God through Jesus. And so we partner with Jesus in his mission to seek and save the lost. Again, the call of discipleship is to follow Jesus, to be changed by Jesus, and to be engaged in mission with Jesus. Of course, answering the call of discipleship begins with the desire and the decision to become a disciple of Jesus. And if you want to do that, Simply believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and upon your trust in Him, to turn to Him in repentance, confessing Him as Lord and Savior, and then commit yourself to Him by being immersed in the watery grave for the forgiveness of your sins. And then rising up out of the water, well, you continue to live your life for Him until Jesus comes again, or you go to be with Him. And for those of us who have already answered the call of discipleship, for those of us who are already Christians, may we always do our best to help others answer the call of discipleship. Again, if anyone has the need to share, to seek prayer, or to become a Christian for the very first time, I want to encourage you to message us through Facebook or YouTube, or you can email me directly at minister at ovchurch.org. Let's pray. Father God, we do so thank you for this day. And Father, we pray that as we think about our lives as the disciples of your son, Jesus, that we reflect upon our call of discipleship and that we truly follow your son, Jesus, and that we allow ourselves to be changed by him and to follow the mission of your son, Jesus. And Father, we pray that you will instill within us the desire to be better disciples for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, we want to thank you for spending your Lord's Day with us and pray that you will worship with us again the next time we meet here at Orangevale, 9 a.m. Sunday mornings at our building. Of course, we do understand that that might not be possible for some. So we do hope that you will continue to assemble with us right here on YouTube and Facebook at 11 a.m. on Sundays. Thank you and God bless.